When Intel first introduced the i9 a few years back, I think the last thing on their minds was restraint. It was supposed to be the best of the best, and if it took a ton of power and produced a ton of heat to achieve that, then so be it. Geekom's new top-end Mini IT13 is a compact NUC-type PC that can hide behind a CD case, and yet is available with up to a 13th gen i9 CPU on board. Will Intel's current architecture thrive in such a small form factor, or will thermal and power limit throttling hold it back? Let's start by looking at that CPU. The i9-13900H is naturally a mobile chip. It has 14 cores and 20 threads in total, breaking down into 6 performance and 8 efficient cores. According to Intel's own specs on the chip, it tops out at 5.4GHz on the big cores and 41 on the little ones, with a TDP of 115 watts. Geekom's implementation here is a little more conservative, limiting that TDP to just 80 watts. Given the restraints of the NUC format, there's no discrete GPU either. You're limited to the onboard Intel XE graphics, with 96 execution units at up to 1500 MHz. Intel have been making some pretty big strides in the world of graphics processors lately, so I don't think it's unreasonable to expect some decent gaming performance, though the IT13 clearly hasn't been designed with that in mind, as the choice of DDR4 rather than DDR5 would suggest. For non-gaming tasks, the Intel XE still has plenty to offer, not least of which being a comprehensive range of codec support, including AV1, making this quite an interesting option for anyone working with video. Beyond the i9 CPU, the specs are rounded out by the aforementioned DDR4 RAM, which comes in the form of a dual-channel kit of Lexar 3200 speed sticks. This one came loaded with 32GB, though it is user upgradable to a maximum of 64. It also comes specced with a Lexar 2TB Gen 4 NVMe drive, and has room for a second M.2, as well as a 2.5-inch SATA drive. These specs will set you back £699 or $789, with i7 and i5 models available with less RAM and storage for £599 and £499 respectively. I have links for the reviewed i9 model in the description on both Geekom's site and Amazon, as well as a discount code for £40 or dollars off. Geekom supplied the IT13 for review, but no money has changed hands, I do not earn a commission for sales, and all my opinions are my own. Externally, the Mini IT13 itself doesn't look all that different from many other NUC-type Mini PCs on the market, barring its cool blue colour scheme. It is a little smaller than the last mini PC I reviewed, but it still has a decent range of connectivity for its size. On the front, we have a pair of USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type A holes, one of which is PD enabled, a combined mic headphone jack, and a power button. On the rear, we have two HDMI ports, a 2.5 gigabit Ethernet port, a third USB 3.2 Gen 2 port, a USB 2, a port for the 19 volt mains adapter, and a pair of USB 4 Type C ports capable of double pen, capable of display output, and very exciting for me, on the left side there's a full size SD card reader. I tested this reader with a 128GB Lexar UHS-2 SD card, rated for up to 250MB a second, and I was able to transfer files at a fairly steady 100 to 120MB per second. Finally, for wireless connectivity, there's the now expected Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.2. Unscrewing the bottom of the case reveals that 2.5-inch bay with a very thin ribbon cable connecting to the PCB that you'll have to be very careful with. On the PCB itself, we have nice easy access to the SODIMS, the main M.2 slot already populated, the Wi-Fi card underneath that, and a space for an extra M.2 alongside it. Tearing the IT13 down further is possible, if a bit more complicated, but that's only really necessary to repaste the CPU or replace the CMOS battery. On booting the PC, the BIOS is about the most bare bones I've ever seen. There's date and time, some I.O. settings, boot sequence, but the only meaningful difference that it gives control over is the fan profile, which I pushed up to performance to make sure the CPU isn't being held back unnecessarily. I ran the CPU Z benchmark just for a very quick sanity check to make sure the PC is functioning as expected, and it didn't look good. Usually I run CPU Z three times and take an average, 
but the difference in the three runs was staggering. It went from 7200 on the first run, to 7700 on the second, to 6500 on the third. This was weird behaviour to me, so out of curiosity, I kept going, one run after another. Almost every subsequent benchmark was lower than the last, to the point that the 10th run scored just under 6100. Looking at Hardware Info 64 during a stress test, we can see what's really going on. The performance cores hit 100 degrees immediately before throttling back to 2.8 GHz. The efficient cores drop as low as 2 GHz. After the initial spike, temps quickly settle in the 70s to 80s, and the fan really isn't working all that hard. Clearly the CPU has been tuned for low noise and an all-core stress test like CPU-Z means that clock speeds drop a long way to accommodate this. Unlike the short burst type workloads simulated by CPU-Z, Cinebench R23 simulates more sustained tasks. The standard run consists of a 10 minute looping render before giving a final score, however if you hover over the graph you can get an idea of what the running score is after each completed render. The first one scored 12,500, the second dropped below 12,000, and by the end of the 10 minutes that score had bottomed out at 11,700. For context, the start of the run is close to a Ryzen 7 4700 APU, but by the end of the run the score's on par with a Ryzen 5 5600X, and a whopping 4000 points short of the Ryzen 7 7840HS I tested in another mini PC. Geekbench is a new test for me, so I only have the Ryzen 7840HS for comparison. The multi-score reaches over 11600, which is about 500 points short of the AMD chip. The 3D Mark test covers both the CPU and GPU side of things, and, as is so often the case, reveals a pretty big imbalance between the two. In Time Spy, the CPU scores 8700, while the GPU is only slightly below 1700. These are massively down from the Ryzen, which scored over 10k on the CPU and 2800 on the GPU. The latter figure isn't surprising, AMD's integrated graphics have earned themselves a good reputation, but the CPU win was still a bit of a shock. The margin in the older Firestrike benchmark is similarly huge and still favours the AMD unit. I had high hopes for Intel in DaVinci Resolve Studio, as I'd heard great things about QuickSync, and thought this might make for an interesting portable video editing system. While even highly compressed 4K60 long GOP footage from my Fujifilm X-T3 plays back pretty well, it's not noticeably better than the Ryzen APU. Meanwhile, its render times are abysmal by comparison. Five minutes of graded clips exported to H.264 took almost 16 and a half minutes on the XE graphics, and almost 19 minutes on the CPU. This is almost twice as long as the same test took on the AMD. The Blender Classroom render took 8 minutes 20 seconds for the 13900H, which is about 2.5 minutes longer than the 7840HS. The UI seemed to offer the option to use the iGPU instead, however I think this may have been a bug, I'm pretty sure the workload was still being handled by the CPU, and the render time was about the same. With the productivity tests out of the way, I loaded up a few lighter weight games that are more suited to this calibre of iGPU, and which aren't on my usual benchmark roster, so I'm not especially making a comparison here, but it should give you an idea of how well this thing can game. Apex Legends was surprisingly smooth, all things considered. 1080p low with no resolution scaling hit roughly 60 FPS with 1% lows of 43 and 0.1s of 34. I turned off anti-aliasing to squeeze out a tiny bit more performance, though it might be worth keeping AA enabled and dropping resolution to maybe 900p as a better compromise while still keeping things legible. Battlebit Remastered is built for this. At 1080p potato settings, it's still superbly smooth, running at near 120 FPS with lows of 85. The single digit point ones are caused by respawning as far as I can tell, and aren't really anything to worry about. Considering how much more graphically demanding Counter-Strike 2 is than its predecessor, I was surprised to get such a good result here. At 1080 low with FSR disabled, the game manages almost 75 FPS. 
1% and 0.1% are pretty painful, and you'll struggle to play competitively, but it's not strictly unplayable. Fortnite, however, I don't know, this is worse than I usually expect from this game. Sure, it's known to stutter at the start of the match, but this was excessive. At 1080p in performance mode, the average FPS was a very acceptable 84, but the experience never felt smooth for even a moment. The 1% and 0.1% lows are well out of place, and although I had a pretty good game this time around, it's hard to recommend. Overwatch 2 was a similar story, playable looking averages marred by unacceptable 1% and 0.1% lows. At 1080 low, it looks like 71 FPS, but it feels like a mess. Of course, not everyone wants to play esports, and I don't believe in letting iGPUs off the hook too easily. Forza Horizon 5 is actually playable, though obviously it needs a few settings to be reduced in order to get a smooth frame rate. At 1080p, the low preset can give a greater than 30 FPS experience, averaging 39. If you want a little more in the way of visual quality, it is possible to maintain a 30 plus average at medium, thanks to some quality FSR upscaling, but lows drop slightly below the 30 mark. Finally, the Civilization VI AI benchmark completed with an average turn time of 7.77 seconds, on par with the Ryzen APU, and frankly a lot slower than I expect from a modern processor. As far as power consumption is concerned, the highest I saw from the wall during the Cinebench run was about 110 watts, though that quickly fell as the clock speed dropped. Within about a minute, consumption was down to just 55 to 60 watts. During gaming, consumption was a little higher at about 65 watts, and watching YouTube it peaked at about 40, but was mostly closer to 15 to 18 watts, which isn't that far above idle. But what if you wanted to live dangerously? Can you wring a little more performance from the IT13? Well, sort of. Like I said, the BIOS is utterly bereft of meaningful control, the designers had a specific target in terms of heat and noise, and how dare you for wanting to ignore them. There's no included app for controlling TDP either, but for that you can download Intel's Extreme Tuning Utility. Now, the i9-13900H isn't overclockable, nor can it be undervolted, but the TDP restrictions can be removed and the boost durations extended. In XTU, that's just a matter of dragging some sliders all the way over to the right. The result is a system that's now far more forgiving of noise and high temperatures, and will clock a decent amount higher in all-core stress tests, up to about 3.4GHz for the performance cores, and about 2.8GHz on the efficient cores. What does this mean for performance? Well, the CPU Z falloff is far less severe, stabilising at a score in the low 7000s. Cinebench gained over 4000 points, with only a 160 point drop from the first run to the last. GPU intensive tasks like video encoding are unaffected however, as the extra wattage doesn't result in any higher iGPU clocks. Forza Horizon 5 gains almost nothing on average, though minimums are slightly improved. Fortnite also sees significantly improved frame pacing, to the tune of almost double the 1% lows. Point ones are still atrocious, but this is now far more playable. Of course, now the 100 degree temperature limit becomes the bottleneck, and under sustained load this becomes a lot more common. The package temp runs at about 98 degrees in Cinebench and CPU Z, and remains high in other CPU workloads too. Games are less of a problem, at least the kind I've tested today, but to be clear, even at the higher TDP, this isn't even close to a Ryzen chip for gaming. The other aspect of running without the TDP limits is power consumption. At stock settings, peak draw is 100 watts, but more commonly it hovers around the 50s and 60s when the CPU throttles. With the limits removed, peak draw is now up to about 110 watts, but this time it pretty much stays there, maintaining about 100 watts for the entire Cinebench run, and the fans got uncomfortably loud. As exciting as it was to see the benchmark numbers go up, I'm not sure I can recommend doing this. Without any kind of undervolting, the CPU is just going to slowly cook itself to death under sustained workloads, and if you're not stressing the CPU, why bother removing the TDP limits?
In summary then, the Mini IT13 sacrifices quite a lot of processing power in order to keep within Geekom's heat and noise parameters. The highlight feature of the world's first i9 in a mini PC sounds very impressive, but with an 80 watt power limit the CPU can't really fulfil its potential. The i7 has the same number of P-cores, E-cores and total threads, and the same iGPU. The only difference is clock speeds, and if it has the same TDP limit as the i9, then I don't think there'll be a practical difference between the two CPUs. On the other hand, after using the £40 or dollar discount code, you're only paying £60 or dollars more for the i9 over the i7, and you're also getting double the flash storage. That extra terabyte might be worth the money on its own, especially if you're not all that enthusiastic about fitting your own SSD. Anyway, that's more than enough conclusions for one video. If you're interested in buying one, don't forget the links below, including the £40 discount code for the i9 model. Also, as part of their 20th anniversary, Geekom is running a sale on their site for all of October, so if you like the idea of a nux style mini PC but maybe don't want to spend £500 plus on a 13th gen model, or you think that maybe a Ryzen powered one might be a better choice, then give Geekom a happy birthday and check them out. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.